Hey guys, thanks for tuning us in for this 39th episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole, brought to you by Smiley's Breezy Vapes. Special guests for this episode include actor Michael Gross, singer-songwriter Dustin Collins, screenwriter and actor Dan Bukatinsky, actress Caroline Aaron, and director Jody Benstock from the new movie Call Waiting. If you would, please take the time to subscribe, drop a like, comment, leave some feedback, and share with your friends. And, of course, we want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Smiley's Breezy Vapes, located at 313 Falcon Road in Altus. You can visit them online at smileysbreezyvapes.com. And they've got all kinds of specials going on, like the, you check them out on Facebook. So they do run the Red Basket specials on disposables. They let you know on Facebook when to find those. You can also call or text at 580-471-VAPE. That's 580-471-8273. The largest selection of disposable flavors in Southwest Oklahoma. That's at Smiley's Breezy Vapes, 313 Falcon Road in Altus. Our first guest on this episode is actor Michael Gross. You remember him from Family Ties. Now in the seventh installment of the Tremors movie franchise. Take you back a little bit to the 80s and uh, and 90s, and also today we've got uh, Michael Gross on the line with us. Michael, been a big fan for many years. It's a it's a privilege to visit with you this morning. Thank you, Cameron. And let me say what a pleasure it is to be in Oklahoma. I have good friends in uh, good friends in Enid, and uh, I the first play I ever did in high school was Rogers and Hammerstein's <laughs> Oklahoma. So I feel like I know your state. That's how this all started with me, with a musical by Rodgers and Hammerstein in your fair state. Yeah. And uh, it, it continues on. And uh, like I mentioned, got uh, the, the new movie, uh, Tremors. And uh, t- tell us about the, the new version or the new episode of Tremors that's out. Yeah, this is the, the seventh installment of uh, Tremors, something that came out 30 years ago, uh, right on the heels of Family Ties. And... Um, yeah, this is uh, it's it's a horror movie, but I should also say it's a I think a family friendly horror movie because uh, um, the, uh, the pe- pe- there is a body count, but it's due to the monsters. People don't kill other people in this in this thing. Monsters do. And the people uh, set aside their differences to fight a common enemy, and uh, the good guys are the people, the bad guys are the monsters. We don't fight each other. The other thing I should, probably should say is uh, this character is a the character I've, I've played for seven, seven films, 30 years now, is a man named Burt Gummer. He's a right-wing survivalist, uh, comically paranoid and obsessive-compulsive disordered. And uh, again, I think family-friendly because in spite of his cache of weapons, he's never turned his gun on another human being. So it's, uh, in that respect, I think it's, it's something for the entire family. Good old monster movies, 50 style. <laughs> there you go. And, and and did you ever have any belief or inclination when you were working on the first one that it was going to uh, go into second, third, fourth, much less even the, the seventh Shrieker <laughs> Island that's available? Cameron, I never thought Family Ties was going to last past the pilot. So there, <laughs> there's, your, there's your answer. Being an actor, I'm a fatalist. I assume any job I have, one, they've made a mistake in casting me, and they're going to find it out the minute I open my mouth. And two, if they do keep me, it's the last job I'll ever have. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's no, I had no idea. And it, uh, it it took a while to get it going, too. The Tremors, the original, really didn't find itself until the uh, aftermarket videos. In the good old days of VHS is where this thing really caught on in a huge way after its theatrical release. So it's just been a real blessing because the characters like – Oh, I don't know. Mining comic gold. It really is fun. And uh, the the times obviously have changed in marketing this time around. Uh, obviously quite different, Michael. Uh, wh- what have you had to learn to do this year that uh, because of COVID that, uh, the, that you hadn't done before? Well, you know, I'm rather enjoying uh, the Zoom experience. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of that. And uh, once upon a time, you know, if you wanted, uh, I did the Today Show yesterday, yesterday or the day before, yeah, the day before. Once upon a time, you had to go fly to New York, put you up in a hotel for two nights just to have three minutes on screen. Now you can do that on, you know, in the studio. Now you can do that from your home. And I find it actually a lot easier, as, as I suppose a lot of people are finding right now with, uh, you know, remote work. Um, I think it's toughest on kids. 
and uh, I think we, we, we are, we are social people, all of us, not just the kids, but, uh, but adults. And so if we, you know, I, I hope, you know, there's a, there's a place for, for remote learning and remote work, but I hope it doesn't last forever. <laughs> That's for sure. And, uh, again, the, uh, the movie Tremors Shrieker Island on Blu-ray DVD and, uh, and digital, it is out there now. And, uh, Michael always want to make sure and, uh, let our listeners know where they can find more information about the movie. And then obviously everything you've got oh. going on social media wise too. Well, uh, thank you. That's kind of you to ask. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, <laughs> I uh, have uh, I have a, a page on Facebook, and it's simply facebook.com slash actor Michael Gross. There's also, uh, you know, Instagram and, and Twitter and all that sort of thing, but it's basically, that's a good place to start. And, um, and, and uh, the film is also available on Netflix, and if they want to some, see something really insane and funny, um, on YouTube right now, my character Bert Gummer is running for president. So if you go on YouTube... <laughs> go on YouTube and look for uh, Burt Gummer for president. There are four or uh, maybe five episodes uh, up to up and to the election. And uh, if if I if I uh, if I lose, if people don't enough people don't write me in on November third, I'm going to keep running for another four years. I don't care what. They <laughs> That's good stuff. So, <laughs> well, well, Michael, I'm not conceding. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Michael, it is uh, it has truly been a privilege to visit with you this morning. Like I said, I've been a fan for so many years. Uh, looking forward to checking out the new film. I know my daughter will absolutely love it as well. And uh, hope you have a, a great rest of your week, my friend. Cameron, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Stay safe, be well, and uh, hope we do this again. Again, our sponsor for this episode, Smiley's Breezy Vapes at 313 Falcon Road. And uh, they do want to let you know, excited as the doors are open with protective plexiglass, masks are required to cover the nose and the mouth. And of course, with the uh, weather cooling down out there, they wanted to take care of their great customers. Yeah, they do have new hardware in, and like we always talk about, the largest dis the largest selection of disposable flavors in Southwest Oklahoma. That's all at Smiley's Breezy Vapes, 313 Falcon Road, here in Altus. Up next, had the chance to visit this afternoon with singer-songwriter Dustin Collins, and we'll share that visit with you. All right, guys, our next guest here on the 39th episode of uh, Good Questions with Cameron Dole, uh, country artist, uh, singer, songwriter, and uh, and guitarist as well. Uh, he's uh, Dustin Collins. I'm going to let him explain, uh, d describe kind of where he's from and uh, where he's back to, I guess, right now, especially during quarantine. First off, uh, Dustin, thanks for your time, brother. Man, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's uh, it's good to be finally back working and, and uh, playing music again. There you go. Now, uh, now tell our, our listeners uh, a little bit about uh, about Dustin, where it all where it all started, where where the first music when what, what was the first song that made you go ooh? Man, uh, Alan Jackson, believe it or not, and I was a small kid. I loved Alan Jackson. <laughs> my my dad, and my uncle played music uh, my whole life. So it's I started playing guitar at ten, and then. Um, got you know got real into it in high school and, and there's not too many places for kids to play music in uh rural kentucky so we you know we played at the school uh, talent show and the pool hall and uh every bonfire and farm party from here all the way out to loretta and I, i'm from just a small central kentucky town nothing but farmland and uh a uh, bunch of back roads heathen kids <laughs> and and is that how does that how has that influenced your your musical styles uh i mean i i like to think whenever i'm writing is that home is the central it's the central thing in in my music it, is that you know i wouldn't be the same person without this place and no matter where i go you know all roads lead back to uh nelson county kentucky and <laughs> you know i'm just I'm proud and, and happy to be from where I'm from. And I know a lot of people out there that live in small towns feel the same way. And what is it about your small town or, or the community that, uh, that makes it special to you? Oh, uh, the people, it's the people, uh, friends, people I've known my entire life. And, 
you know, we all hunt and fish, go to church together, and you know, the whole the whole deal. We're all you can't get away from each other. <laughs> <laughs> now, how is this year? Uh, like we said before, we we came on. You're used to doing uh, live in studio type of stuff. How is how has this year obviously been different uh, in the promotion, trying to get the music out there? Well, it's made radio tours a lot easier. <laughs> Not so much drive time or uh, hotels, and you know, you just flip the laptop open. The worst, I mean the. If, you, if you're late to an in-studio, you might not get in there like today. I was a little bit late, so uh, it was just flipping the laptop off and, and, and finding the link. Now, what have, you had to, what have you had to learn the most this year? Patience. Patience has is, is been, you know, wanting to get, get in. And, and we're, we've just started a new album project, so uh, we're, we're looking at releasing a, my first full-length 10-song album this year after three EPs and, and I, you know, I'm chopping at the bit to get these songs wrote and, and write. And, you know, being in Nashville, like we're locked down, you know, and, and it's hard to write. We've tried these zoom rights. And for me, I can't really get into the headspace to write unless I'm in a room with somebody. And, you know, I just, you lose so much of it coming through speakers. Um, Cause uh, writing for me is pretty personal and, and, so I, I've, you know, setbacks like that. And then of course, having half our tour, uh, this year canceled will make you really patient. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we, we're just looking for odd things to play, you know, kind of like, uh, as close as I could say to odd jobs and music, <laughs> you know, we've done a lot of private stuff and went to other people's houses and, and, and played and did some stuff like that. Has the has the odd jobs this year? Does it uh, do the years previous compare to the the odd jobs you've done that you were like, yeah, I'll do that this year? Oh no, I mean, I like I've never taken uh, in my life, never really done private home events, and uh, we had this idea this year to do a bonfire tour, uh, which was nice and socially distanced out, outside, and we wasn't going to take no PA equipment. It was just going to be legit campfire singing. And we've had a blast doing that. And uh, a lot of those opportunities spilled over to, well, I know this guy or I know this guy, so you'll be up in Ohio or we just come back from South Dakota. And uh, now now we're like booking up stuff for next year and they want the whole band and the whole thing. And, and so it's it's been really a blessing in disguise. And I think we'll do this bonfire tour every year now, at least, you know, five or six shows. Uh, where we pick five or six of the uh, of fans that want us to come out to their house. And, and, you know, as long as we pass a background check, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll come out there and play. Cause you know, sometimes you just don't know what you're walking into. And back in the early days of touring, you know, there was, there was bars that were kind of questionable. <laughs> If you were in Southeast Indiana, I guarantee, uh, or, or, or Northeast, uh, Kentucky, there's, there's a little, it gets a little uh, scary over there. We played, uh, I can't remember the name of the town, but this has probably been six or seven years ago. The guy at the bar, we were in North Georgia, and uh, he sent me the directions, and they were all, I had to write them down <laughs> because there was no service on the phone to uh, follow GPS, and his directions included, he goes, about a half mile down the road past the big tree and across the street from the dollar store. I have the worst GPS story in history. I did a, I had a DJ gig in a town that I'd never done before. And, uh, the, the guy that asked me to fill in. So the, the original DJ ended up having something else come up. So they asked me like two weeks in advance and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Well, he gave me the, he said, okay, here's the GPS coordinates. Just take them. He said, uh, so I clicked on it as I got about 30 miles away from the town and uh, everything looked good until I get about five miles. It tells me I've got five miles left, but it's going to take me 31 minutes. And we're in Oklahoma. I mean, there's nothing going to take you 31 minutes to get five miles because you can see five miles. And uh, anyway, it took me down a little bitty dirt road and then took me through, honest to God, pasture land, driving along fences. I actually had to get out of my car twice to open gates and all, oh, I could, man. All, all I could think is I'm getting shot. And it told me that, that, that this was a lane the whole way. There was like Johnson lane. It told me I'm on Johnson lane at 15 minutes. I was driving. I was, I was four wheeling. 
luckily I was in the Yukon. <laughs> <laughs> There's some places out here like that. You get off the wrong way, you you'll be like, huh. <laughs> you better watch it out in the sticks right we got well there's a road out here called wilson creek and um i don't know uh, if you're familiar you go down a creek road sometimes the road ain't there anymore <laughs> and and you just like you gotta wait and see if the water's up before you can cross the road because <laughs> there's no bridge you just drive through the creek creek bank took a buddy from, from tennessee he come up here to go fishing we went down that road and he was like man it's like, is this, is this a road or is this somebody's property? I was like, oh, this is a road. I said, it comes out the other end. This is a thoroughfare right here. <laughs> yeah, he thought he thought we was going to get murdered. <laughs> you make a wrong turn in, in, in certain parts of Kentucky. That's right. Yeah, I, especially up there in the hills. <laughs> That's right. Now, now, Dustin, you got your guitar there, and uh, I hate to make you wait any longer to pluck on that thing. I know you said you've been uh, getting practiced, uh, getting ready to hit the road again, right? Yeah, we're going to uh, head out to Lexington, Kentucky tonight, and then uh, Shelbyville, Kentucky tomorrow, so some home shows after a long week of being out in uh, the Midwest. So uh, we're pretty happy about that, and uh, you know, just releasing the single and stuff. We, we've been fairly well on these computers for about a week, trying to you know boost that out and get it out to the folks, and um, I'm just excited to get to play again. Uh, getting to play in front of actual fans as opposed to playing, uh, you know, uh, live Facebook live shows. Well, what are you going to play for us today? Well, uh, I'll tell you what, um, thinking about playing something, uh, brand new that, uh, we're uh, considering for our new album and I've never played this song, uh, live ever, but it just kind of hit me on my head. And uh, this is uh, just a shot of some things to come. World premiere. World premiere. I was born a blue-collared working man's son. He taught me right from wrong and for gave me full of things he'd hadn't done. He never thought it was quite right, thought he'd never understand. Dad, I wish I had those days with you back again. We all folded papers out in front of the old general store. Every once in a while, Mr. Jenkins will come out, sit on the porch. He talk about the highway and how it once was only one lane. Our children walked to school together long before progress came. He said he's seen a lot of his tomorrows turning into yesterdays. But watch the years turn his wife's golden curls to silver gray. What happened to the small town? The guys I used to hang around. I'm going to the county fair. Friday night we used to paint the town. I'm going to a drive-in show, parking on a back row and fooling around. Man, we used to have a ball. I really thought that we had it all. Simple folks in a small town. Two thousand three, Becky Lynn was a high school homecoming queen. We spent the summer together, Lord, she was a girl for me. Apart down by her river at night, summer dress clumped so tight. Two little warm bodies after a moonlight swim. Soft, warm southern summer night, take me back again. I could almost feel the passion in the touch as that moonlight danced across her skin. Oh, what happened to the small town? The guys I used to hang around. Going to the county fair. Friday night we used to paint the town. Oh, going to a driving show. Parking on a back road and fooling around. Man, we used to have a ball. I really thought that we had it all. Simple folks in a small town. Stable folks in a small town. Stable 
Davos in a small town. World premiere. World premiere. Just drop me. He, he said if I had a mic that wasn't on a stand, I'd drop it. He's, he said, I'm not dropping this mic. <laughs> I try not to drop mics. I, we, back in the day, they think a, a mic drop is cool, but they anybody who's dropped a mic's never paid for one. <laughs> <laughs> like mic drop, and then they go, here, here's the bill for that one. Yeah. Now, Dustin, yeah. if uh, you talked about uh, the, the single that's been released, if, if folks want to find out about that, uh, about the upcoming tour dates, uh, how they can schedule the the the, the barbecue the bonfire, I mean, uh, how they find that information? www.dustincollinsmusic.com. You can also find all of our information, show updates, and everything at uh, backslash Dustin Collins Music on Facebook and Dustin Collins Official on Instagram. And if you're into that kind of thing, we have a Twitter too. And they have, it's Dustin Collins 88 there. They just maybe make a TikTok. Uh, I was against it, but apparently it's the thing that people do now. So this week we're going to start TikToking. Oh, I, I warn you, if you get on my TikTok, it's probably going to have a lot to do with blowing stuff up and cooking barbecue. <laughs> yeah. My wife told me yesterday that uh, I needed just to look into the TikTok and I was like, I, I don't think I'm young enough to be on the TikTok. Yeah, that's what I said. I was like, man, I'm I'm getting up there. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I should be TikToking or not. But uh, well, it's again, a thing. What, so the website DustinCollinsMusic.com. Yep, www.DustinCollinsMusic.com. All right. Well, Dustin, it's been great to visit with you the, today, man. All right. Yeah, man. I, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, and uh, y'all can check out that new single. We would have played that one, but then you wouldn't go listen to it later. So uh, you can find that at Apple Music, uh, Amazon, Google Play, Spotify, everywhere music is sold on the internet. There you go. Well, Dustin, great to visit with you. I uh, hope you have a great weekend. Be safe on the road, brother. All right, you too. Thank you. Again, check him out, DustinCollinsMusic.com. Smiley's Breezy Vapes at 313 Falcon Road. You can call or text them with any questions at 580-471-VAPE. That's 580-471-8273. They are excited to have the doors open. The weather has cooled down, but they do have protective plexiglass in place to protect the customers and the employees. They do ask that masks are required and they must cover the nose and mouth. That's at Smiley's Breezy Vapes, 313 Falcon Road. For the novice to the vaping legend, stop by and see him. 313 Falcon Road, here in Altus. Our last segment is special guest, actor and screenwriter Dan Bukatinsky, actress Caroline Aaron, and director Jody Benstock. We visited in a Zoom meeting earlier today. Share that visit with you talking about the new movie, Call Waiting. It is available on Amazon now. We actually had the chance to visit with Caroline uh, a few months ago talking about uh, the movie Call Waiting. Well, we've got uh, the, the director with us as well. And uh, this is this is exciting. Caroline and uh, Dan Bukatinsky with us this morning or this this afternoon, what, whatever time zone you're on right now. Uh, thank you guys for being a sh- part of the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yep. Glad to be here. Now, now, Dan, we haven't we haven't met yet, so uh, g- give me a little background. I mean, people uh, pe- people know your your face and your name a little bit, right? Yes, yeah, people know me mostly as an actor, um, uh, probably from Scandal. That's probably the number one way people know me. But I've been kicking around for a long time, and as a writer and a, and an actor, and I produce television with Lisa Kudrow for the last seventeen years. So, um, but uh, my husband Don Roos and I have, who is also a collaborator with me for for many many years, um, we just to give you a little bit of background of how Carol, Caroline and I have been friends for over 20 years. And I, I made a film years ago and her children who are now grown were in it. <laughs> um, but my, my, my husband, Don and I went to see Caroline in a play that with that she was spectacular and written by uh, the fabulous uh, Dory Fram, um, an autobiographical story, one person play that, Caroline mastered on stage and and had performed for for a really great long run here in Los Angeles and I turned to my husband as we were leaving as great collaborations or huge mistakes often begin 
what if, like, stop right there. Don't say another word. But what if we made a movie of that play, only instead of opening it up, which most plays to movies do, and you meet all the characters and you see all the worlds, we stayed in the house with this one character, and we never met anybody else on the other side of that phone conversation, and we just had one actor in the whole movie. And that what if began this collaboration with Caroline, with our director, Jody Binstock, and with a few other producers, and myself as a writer and Dory Fram, the original writer, to create a screenplay that would allow us to posit that exact question. What if we shot someone who's only, where the entire movie is really their life from one side of a phone conversation? And therein began our sort of experiment. And it, and it came out uh, several years ago and we won a bunch of festival awards, but people didn't see it. And now that there are so many platforms, we have now are finally launched on Amazon Prime and are so, so proud to, to let people see Caroline's performance. And what, what do you think it is that, that, that took it so long? I mean, obviously right now it, it's, uh, it, it is timely. Yes, I think, I mean, we're all guessing about, you know, the thing about it is if anybody could really know um, what makes something successful, then people would only make successful entertainment product. <laughs> We're all just sort of guessing. Here's our guess in a way is that this is a piece that was written by a woman, directed by a woman, starring a woman. And, you know, women's stories have struggled to be popular entertainment for a really long time time but based on you know rearranging sort of the social landscape in the last couple of years with women demanding more and more um equity in all uh professions in life all of a sudden people are going you know women's stories are good stories and so i think that the time was hospitable and it's what you said cameron Unbeknownst to any of us, this woman's dilemma, let's say what we call the inciting incident of this entire piece, is someone who is homebound. And now she has something in common with the entire country. We're all homebound. So I think it's the combination of those two things, which is the legitimization of women uh, and their stories, and also the fact that we are all at home you know, trying to make a life within the four walls that we all live in. And that's what this character does, is that she's homebound through illness, but her life is still extremely rich and active. It just doesn't take place outside the four walls of her home. And I certainly can relate to that now, and I'm sure you guys can too. <laughs> Me too. And actually, uh, you know, uh, tagging on to what Caroline was saying, like these these opportunities that happen and these windows where, where something suddenly becomes relevant again, it's always just a matter of happenstance. I mean, it just, it just so happens that this circumstance that people find themselves in that is so relatable to our story is happening at a time when women's stories are being embraced more. Women directors are being embraced more. And a third factor, which we have not mentioned, which may be the another important one, which was good timing, is Caroline's uh, notoriety. Caroline has been an actress on, in a, a bajillion films, Woody Allen movies, acclaimed Broadway shows, for, has an illustrious career, but is famous for, for her role in, in Mrs. Maisel, which is a huge hit on Amazon. And the notoriety of the people involved in this project has changed since we made it. You know, my... Uh, the good fortune I had of being on Scandal and the shows that I was able to do afterwards and Caroline's notoriety for being in Maisel. And these things have only helped us raise our ability to talk about it. And, um, you know, that happening at the same time as the interest and the same time of the relatability factor gives us sort of three great reasons why the why it's now you know a film that people will see and really enjoy and, and how hard was it on the on the writing aspect after being a fan of the of the play uh how hard was it for you or, or how nitpicky were you on yourself in making sure everything matched the 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 the, the adaptation as well well 
Well, Cameron, it's a good question because Dory was a was a playwright, you know, when she was studying playwriting and she was, had a love of the theater. And we lost Dory uh, the, last year. So the timing of this as a sort of a tribute to her is also a really, a really good timing. But she was drawing from her personal story. And I had more experience writing for the film. And so I sort of mentored her in adapting the play and every word of that play into what might be a more visual way of expressing it. And in the midst of it all, we, we, we realized that, and my husband was one of the ones who said this, you know, when you're in the theater, you're watching something unfold in real time and you have a lot of things to look at and you are the editor. You as an audience member decide when you're going to cut to or look at the you know, a piece of furniture on the stage, the actress, her face, her clothes. We are editors when we're in the theater. We control that. In a movie, we control what you see. And so there became a need to give us something to cut to without having to blow up the character, you know, bring in other characters. And so we did bring in another character. We decided to bring in another character, but to stay within the, the organic notion of this premise, which is there's only one actor, the other character in this movie is played by Caroline Aaron, same actress. But so I started to write a character in the present who was filming a movie, the actress in the small movie called Waiting, and letting her story unfold simultaneous to the fictional character she was playing and letting them in, in, inform each other. And so Dory was very collaborative in like where we would cut and where, we, where would we put these moments where this other character would speak. And luckily our actress was seamlessly went in from one to the other and allowed us to tell the story that Dory wrote and allowed the small story that I wrote to blend with it in a way that, that makes the movie fuller. Mm -hmm. And I also think we were very lucky in that our director had never seen the play. Yeah. <laughs> for, for her, there was no hangover or resonance. Oh, we did it this way, or it should be this way. So she allowed us all, you know, it's like we've got to all be virgins again in terms of this material. And because Dory was so hospitable about that, she also opened herself up to what is this new thing that we are creating? It exists only as itself. And I think that that was, you know, really exciting. It's hard sometimes when you have been in a play for a really long time and you're very invested in certain moments. You already know when you are going to engage the audience. Here was a laugh. Here was a sigh, you know, those kinds of things. You have to throw all of that out. And our director helped us do that yeah. wonderfully because the rest of us really had this reference in our minds, which was, oh, this is how it worked in the theater. And it's very interesting. It is very different, but it accumulates into the same kind of impact I remember it having in the theater. And um, I think that's a testament to our two writers, Dan and Dory that it still could land in the same way. Because I often feel like, you know, things are more impactful when they're live than when you're seeing them on a screen. That's just my own particular presence. Uh, you know, that's my preference sometimes because I feel like there's that layer between you and me, Cameron, which is the screen. But for some reason, Dan and Dory and Jody were able to make it feel like it was live in this new incarnation, in the same way it felt when you were in the theater. I don't know how they did that, but that was really exciting for people to feel like they were there. And, and the Caroline, yeah, and for, and for you on on this, uh, w when you're doing just the, the bits and pieces as uh, you're doing the scenes, was it, was it harder to get into character as opposed to obviously the live show? How hard was it to get in, get back into character for the scenes as opposed to, uh, you, you know, doing the, the full dramatic presentation? Well, I will say that when you're doing a play, you know, you have that whole runway, you know, that you get, that you go, you're coming up to, let's say, a dramatic moment and you get to ride on the highway and go up the mountain of, let's say, an emotional moment. And you don't get that opportunity in a film. But because I had done the play, I, you know, it was sort of in my body that this is where this character breaks down or she's her most vulnerable or she's her most guarded kind of thing. But what Dan wrote um, whether it was conscious or unconscious, was that the journey of the actress playing the character was very similar to the journey of the fictional character. And it was, you know, 
when you have great writing, it's it takes you on the ride. You don't take it on the ride. And I really do feel like it was great writing. And so it wasn't hard because it was there on the page for me. And believe me, from having done this for a really long time, I have had many experiences where I have to go on a ride without a vehicle. Let me just say, you do it anyway as an actor, but this was not the case. But, the writing was strong. But Caroline, you know, thank you. But I have to tell you that there is a difference between when you, when you get to be in a play, you're experiencing that hour and a half in real time. And so is the audience. And no one is yelling cut. No one is stopping you and asking you to do a moment again. And no one is stopping you and asking you to change your clothes and go back to it. Like you're doing it out of order. It, it, it was in, thank goodness you had done the play and it was inside yeah. your body because we were throwing things at you. If you think about it in a way, if yeah. had, imagine doing a play broken up over 10 days where people are throwing shit at you, Ooh, can right. I swear? where people are throwing, t you know, fruit at you and a new prop and then telling you to do it again and then making noise. And then there's a lot of people like it couldn't be a more distracting environment. And you jumbled the whole the story up into pieces that are, don't, are not even in the same order. It's like some crazy game show where you're being blindfolded and told to do <laughs> a task. And so in many ways, it's a miracle when you at the end of it, and it's a testament to our director who had a vision for this entire story, how it was going to piece together. We had our fights, everybody, you know, over 10 days, you know, the writers fight and, they, and we fight and we argue and we, and out of those arguments usually come whatever are the compromises or whatever are the discoveries um, that wind up being sort of the best version of the, of the movie. And we all feel that way. Absolutely. And Dan, how many hours, like the, the movie is 90 minutes. How many hours of film is part of this 90 minutes? I mean, that's the other uh, thing. It's, I mean, it's hours and hours, hours and hours of footage. I mean, you shoot, yeah. you shoot hours and hours and hours, and then you get, you whittle it down to 90 minutes and so many things wind up in the cutting room floor. There's an interesting story. When you have a playwright whose life was in a play that she's made into a movie, Dory's biggest I call them fights. They weren't fights, but Dory's biggest, uh, you know, uh, debates with us had to do with lines of dialogue or jokes um, <clears throat> that may or may not have played on the stage um, that were like, but that gets the big, that would get the biggest laugh in my show. And we would say, no doubt, no doubt when you perform this live, that would get a great laugh. But in this particular moment, we have to rise and we have to drop and we have to. So, so we would oftentimes have to make, you, you know, you kill some babies, they always say in an editing room and you lose some beautiful pieces of the story that are necessary uh, compromises. Um, and we did that with this as well. Hi everybody, I'm so sorry. I thought it was at 10. <laughs> well, in some parts of the country, it was at 10. <laughs> but not in a part of the country that we're in. I get but it. We want, no, but we were setting you up this whole time. We, you were designed to be an added guest to our podcast. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Cameron, if you would let me introduce you. Uh, we were just talking about the masterful way in which the film was directed with somebody who had a, an idea of how to integrate these two stories, this play, this original autobiographical story, and a lot of people's opinions and points of views and to sort of be our air traffic controller for the whole journey. Jody Benstock. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much. God, I'm glad I came late to the party. <laughs> you missed the bad stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Stuff. Jody, tell us what it was like. I, I know they mentioned uh, how they appreciated fresh eyes uh, working on this project. For you coming in, seeing it for the first time, what was your initial response to uh, to the to the screenplay and the script that you had? Sure. I mean, it, that's that's the interesting part is that I never saw it performed, and so I didn't have any preconceptions about what the um, the staging was or any of that. So when we decided to make it into a movie. You know, for me, aside from the incredible, brilliant idea of opening it up to bring in the, the you know, the other, the Carol Lane story, for me, it was a matter of how do you keep this buoyant and interesting for an hour and a half? You know, um, and so it was a great, fun challenge of how to keep the camera moving and how to keep the actress, um, Caroline, 
uh, engaged in all of the business. And I don't know, if Dan, I don't know who said what about everything. And I'm sick that I wasn't here early. But, um, you know, Caroline is the most brilliant actress I've ever worked with in terms of being able to keep her character so holy and do a tremendous amount of business. Typically, when you give an actor props and you give an actor um, stuff to do, it's, you know, it's this. It's trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. And um, that is not the case with Caroline. She could do anything. I mean, we would do so many things of, you know, simple things, traveling down a hall and talking, but carrying a wedding dress across an entire thing and, and looking around. I mean, the things that she could make alive were incredible. So that was part of the fun things of, of letting the character um, come to life via the actions that a person does in the privacy of their own home when they're not on a Zoom, when they're not, you know, on a video call, but they're on a, a private call. You know, things like, you know, plucking whiskers from a chin. Those are things women do that you don't really see, you know, and nobody talks about. Um, that, or, you know what? You, yeah, bring up a, you bring up a really good point, which I had not really thought through as much as now that I think about it. One of the one of the advantages of us merging, you know, we only we shot this movie in, in two houses that we we made look like one house. And it allowed the, the, the spaces of that house to all seem like discoveries in and out of one bedroom into another bedroom we've never seen before into the master bedroom, into the really, really kind of grand bathroom, then down into the kitchen and the whole area inside the kitchen and then out to the front door and then the, you realize that the landscape of a movie normally which might take you into a village into a town into a restaurant to an airport to a different country we only had this house and jody explored every corner of this house as another character in the story so that the audience is constantly watching this person that we're invested in but in new and fun places and that's another key to making a movie without necessarily transporting you somewhere else. Yeah, and there was thought behind it of things like the only time that this housebound woman goes outside is when she has her epiphany, when she has her confrontation with her sister. And then the world opens up to her and it's the first time we get to breathe. Um, you know, those kinds of things were, you know, thought through very much. When When is the character silent? You know, most of the time she's talking nonstop but there are a couple of salient moments when she hangs up and she's in her own moments. And those were just, you know, that were, those were just gold to mine with Caroline. And I, I can also say that um, it's so interesting that you said that about Zoom. I think one of the things that film does better than anything else and why we love movies in our lives is when they're really good, you feel like you have parted the curtains and you're peeking in on somebody's private life that we would ordinarily never get access to. Whether it's, you know, watching a couple struggle in a relationship, something that they would cover up if they were in public. And the way that Jody orchestrated this in a sense was the dynamic between what the person on the other end of the phone was getting and what you and the audience were watching were very different things. And I think we all do that. You know, how are you? I'm great, how are you? And meanwhile, you know, if you got to see that person, right? You would see that the, that there were a lot of wrappers from different takeout places around their feet. Do you know what I mean? And that their clothes were, po okay, yes, Karen, we did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm good open, today. Okay. Open closet doors and things that I wasn't yeah. anticipating this, that wasn't prepped for the meeting. <laughs> That's right. So, I'm saying, so then the audience has this special experience of, I got to see her and the person that she's talking to didn't get to see her. So it makes the audience yeah. a, a very intimate part of somebody's life. And I think Jody was very aware of that and, and asked me to go places that, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily let somebody, you wouldn't let somebody in on, like going to the bathroom as an example. You know what right. I mean? I think we've all maybe taken a tinkle while we were on the phone, but we've managed not to let the other person know. In this case, the movie let you in on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and when, you know, and how she how she puts on makeup at certain points and, you know, is prep, primping herself or the stuff when, when there's a scene when 
she thinks that her husband is cheating on her where she falls apart. And some of that came from the play, you know, to answer your que your question, Cameron. Like, I think that if I, correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, but I think the um, putting on the underpants was yes. part of, that was part of the original uh, direction, which is just great. Um, and so we took that, but then added on to it, you know, so it was, um, it was really fun. And then the end uh, the other interesting thing to talk about, blah, blah, stop, was that, um, was that when the Caroline Aaron, I'm sorry, not the Caroline Aaron, the Carol Lane character, mm -hmm. um, she was always, you know, outside in her hovel of a garage, you know, and so that was a really interesting, fun thing to contrast. Mm -hmm. I was making sure, I, I, I have my headphones on, so I wasn't sure if it was a dog somewhere else or if it was mine, so that's why I kept yeah, it. All, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and my dog started, you know, they hear one and then they all start barking. <laughs> that's right. Right? Now, on uh, TV. Well, Dan, I, I'm going to give you a chance. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up here in just a second. I, I truly appreciate the time we've had. And Jody, thank you so much for uh, for, for joining us down the hallway. That was a, that was a, that was a great view. <laughs> just, sick, just sick about that. I really apologize. <laughs> But Dan, I want to make sure and let uh, let everybody know uh, where to find the film. Obviously, on Amazon, and uh, each of you guys uh, let our listeners know where they can keep up with everything social media wise as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The film is now um, on uh, Amazon, as I mentioned. Um, so you just go to Amazon and you can go to video and you can enter call waiting and you find the film. You can follow the film on Instagram and on Twitter as call waiting movie. And you can follow each of us um, on social media, Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Uh, we post as often as we can stuff about the movie, stuff about our careers and uh, um and also, uh, and it's at Dan Bukatinsky and at the Carol, uh, uh, Caroline Aaron and Jody Ben at Jody Binstock. Um, and we're constantly giving people sort of behind the scenes looks and photographs and interviews that they can catch up with. But most importantly is just click and watch the film. It's the one of the most unique films anybody will ever see because I don't know of another movie that only has one actor in it um, that has ever been made, really. Um, that's not boring. That is so funny and so dynamic that I would recommend people just to watch it, just to see something, an innovation in filmmaking that, that has never happened before. And a tour divorce performance. Performance, for sure. Well, again, Caroline, Dan, and Jody, thank you guys so much uh, for being a part of the show today. And uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Caroline, always good to see you. Nice thank to you, see you, Cameron. Bye-bye. Again, thanks for joining us for this episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. And if you ever have a comment, a question, or anything else you'd like to know, find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, feel free to click the support tab and follow the instructions. If you have a special guest idea, feel free to email gqwithcam at gmail.com. Again, thanks to our sponsor for this episode, Smiley's Breezy Vapes at 313 Falcon Road. We'll be back with episode 40 on Monday. <laughs> <laughs>